so welcome guys with another reaction with the toxic channel i hope everyone is doing good uh i don't know what is going on on lately with the youtube it's like uh, it's hard to connect and stuff so i might post some stuff on rumble you can find some stuff some rumble so you can just check it i will leave you the my channel on rumble you never know you never know what's going to happen in the future so i will just uh, put it there and post videos there also in case uh as we can speak about we have we did andrew tate uh, with uh, rob moore same same place but he interviewed uh, Andrew Tate, now he interviewing uh, Tristan Tate. I think this one is going to be funny, informative. It's not going to be like all the other. It was going to be, It's going. it will be the opposite of what happened with Andrew Tate. Uh, I'm going to also put uh, the store, guys, in the link in the description. You find the store there. You can buy something there, purchase something. And I will show you the video what we have in the store. It can attract your eyes, one of the t-shirts. So here you go. What else you can also guys subscribe if you want to see more and uh, subscribe in the, the rumble channel just in case for me to be able to post there in the future you never know so subscribe here there and so let's just dig into the video and see what's going on it's two hours 30 i know it's going to be long but we're going to do it to two parts maybe three parts for you to be able to follow and to not get bored through all this video but it's going to be uh, information for you if you are if you are seeking for information and stuff and knowledge and stuff you're going to you're going to find in this kind of interview and podcast but if you just want to uh, searching for entertainment uh there is a lot of things that can entertain you i uh, have it in the channel like songs like uh family gay like you're gonna find other things but this one is for information if you're seeking for information of course tristan tate said to me he doesn't do interviews as long as andrew tate and i went and got the longest interview on record with tristan tate success is a form of revenge i think it's the only form of revenge that any man should ever care care about trying to reach in this exclusive episode tristan slams the uk the uk has just failed they're not fixing the most basic issues if i walk down on the street even with this is a moderately priced rolex and i start walking around there's a good chance that someone's going to put a knife through my heart to take my watch tristan gives an exclusive on who's really behind his arrest and that the truth will come out as soon as the case is over the entire world is going to know exactly why this happened why did it happen? Who set the dogs on me? And I think everyone's going to be very, very shocked. And he talks about the downfall of the monarchy. I'm not saying what happened to Harry was okay. What I'm saying is to subject your poor grandmother to the accusation of racism in 2022, for me, unforgivable. So Tristan, who controls the world? <laughs> oh, obviously. Why he jumped like that? Why he jumped like that? <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna see. I, like I told you, it's gonna be really a lot of information we can see, we can get from this interview. Funny things, historian like uh, Tristan is famous for not film being a historian, but he read, uh, he like history. So you're gonna get uh, much more information with him also, in a funny way. My brother and me, you know, <laughs> you haven't seen his hand symbol. It's all secret Illuminati <laughs> stuff, you know. You know, the conspiracy theorists are right. The people who accuse me of, of, of being the Illuminati are right. It's all Andrew. <laughs> you must have learned being imprisoned and cancelled you must have got further up the chain of who runs the world oh a million percent uh a million percent in fact going to prison being cancelled this attack on me has connected me and andrew politically on a level that we weren't at before we've made far more important friends millionaire billionaire businessmen uh politicians lots more people are happy to sit and talk to us, uh, certainly in private, maybe not so much in public these days, until my case is over, than ever before. So yeah, if you were to ask me in a very simple term, you know, Andrew uses the term matrix all the time. What, what controls the world? Money. Big companies, big interests, they can buy governments, they can buy policy, they can make regulations, which are basically the same as laws, and they can get the people to dance when they want them to dance, stay home when they want them to dance, uh, stay home, clap when they want them to clap. And I think money controls the world. And people, do you think that's right, fair, just? Yes, I, I do and I don't. I'm not one of the people out there. 
You know, you have people who have, I met a man many years ago, played in a band, uh, complete, I guess, I guess the word is bum. And he was showing me these documents for a completely new political system he came up with. It wasn't democracy, it wasn't communism. He was like, oh, and this new political system, it would really take off. And I'm like, bro, you, you play in a band and you live in Eastern Europe. Like, what universe do you think that this is ever going to, even if you're right, even if this is the golden ticket for all of humanity, how do you expect anybody to listen to you when you're sitting there playing in a band all day? So uh, what I do is I try to change the world on more of a micro level. I don't try to change who runs the world, who controls the world, how the monetary system works, how fair or unfair it is. I try to look at the game and play the game as best as I understand the rules. So changing on a micro level can be something as little as inspiring young men to get into shape, to care more about their health. You know, that, I mean, that should, in theory, lower the cost of healthcare for every developed nation if everybody listened to mine and Andrew's advice. And it's the micro level change that I'm more interested in pursuing myself. I'm not trying to run for office. I'm not trying to change the laws. And the, w the world is set up the way it's set up. So I just try and win the game, as you have. You know, <laughs> Get a bunch of money, put it in your bank. Oh, what's the money worth? What's it backed by? I don't care. I have lots of it. And it can buy real things. It buys it's real true. food and real properties and real cars and you know, real experiences. And it gets you plane tickets and private jets and all the things that you want. So do I really care what it's backed by? You know, mm. it's not an issue that I try to alter. You know what I, hate, what I hate about people? I don't like people when they tell you like, oh, you know, I'm rich, but there is a lot of rich people where they are unhappy. Who gives a fuck if you're unhappy? Like, they say money doesn't buy happiness. And he's in a yacht. I don't know where he is in Monaco or some shit like that. Where, you, know, you know what I'm trying to, to tell you about but in the end of the day like the money is just a tool and you can use it in how it please you but in the end you need that on uh, that amount of money and still you can use it as it please you if you want if you if 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 giving it if making it and giving it to, to poor people helping make you happy then earn more and give more if if your goal is to make your father or your mother retire to not work anymore your brothers and sister doesn't need to work, staying home, having car, making business all together, then just make you happy and earn work for it. So money ha is just a tool and the way you're going to use it, it's the way that it's going to make you happy. But if you use it in alcohol and girls and stuff like them, buying luxury things like it's not, Im the, it's not important in this world, is you, you can show off still, but it's at the end of the day, it's not important. What is important is when you tell your mom to, you don't need to work anymore. The, the, you can spend whatever you want. Here you go, rest, go here, go here. Tell your father, here you, here you go. Here. So that's things. That's the important thing that can make you happy, really. Sincere. I never will. Do you think maybe in some ways, whoever controls the world, the governments, the big corporations, they're just running a company, like you're running a company and I'm running a company, and if we were controlling the world, we might run the company in a similar way. I believe I'm a much, I'm a far more moral person than some of the people. So some of the large companies and the people behind them that control the money, I feel like they're happier to flush human lives down the toilet than I ever would be. So when you look at some countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, as, as example, that's run like a business and the leaders and the people sit around sure. and think, okay, we have this many resources, we have this much space, how do we best make our company uh, profitable, how do we make it safe, how do we make everyone inside of it happy. So as with real companies, I've had good bosses and I've had bad bosses, I think the world as a whole is overwhelmingly, unfortunately, controlled by evil money. And I see that with the wars that happen, the people who die every day, the, the lockdowns and some of the restrictions they try to put on people, how little they care about the little guy. I would be a far more moral leader. I wouldn't send young men to die in a pointless war. I wouldn't finance wars, try to start them for profit, benefit, nothing. If I can end all war and be financially broke myself, there's a button right here I can press, good, I'll live on the streets for the rest of my life. Whereas this clearly isn't the attitude of some of the people at the top. They're happy to enrich themselves, enrich their families, and who goes to die? The poor people. Poor people go and die, and of course I'm, now I have some money. But I am essentially a poor person with lots of money. I'm a working class guy. I come from a council estate. It's me and my people who have to march off. To you know, I would like to speak about this 
point uh, exactly like when I was in Algeria you have you in every country you need to pass the objective of the army if you if you call it the army it's like an obligation for you to pass it so I didn't pass it and I didn't go, wanted to pass it so I I went to university just to not pass it and I end up studying university anyway I study it in the university sociology as a psychologist it's just I study it I love it I like it but in the end of the day I didn't want to go to the army so the idea of the army but i didn't like it since i was like i don't know since they start searching for for you to pass the army like if you stop school like 22 21 you need to go to the army so uh, the idea of it i don't like it because they force you to go to the army but they send their sons to study in europe or to study in america or canada but no you need to go and pass it but their son no they would like them to stay home and be in comfortable situation eating food staying with their mother so fuck no i'm not to their, you know, to their wars and go and fight and die. I said this the other day. I was naming the number of children certain UK politicians have, numbers of sons. Uh, I can't remember the exact names of the exact kids. I Googled them on the spot. I don't know off the top of my head, but it was like, you know, this minister, that minister, this member of parliament all have sons aged 17 to 25. And I said, well, unless their sons are going with me, I wouldn't go. <laughs> exactly. Know, That's what I was saying. Bloody wars. I mean, it's so important. Oh, yeah. It's so important. Like you harp on about it in the news all the time or stand in the House of Parliament and lecture people about the importance of these military operations. Good. Send your own kids. But they never do. Exactly. That's what I was saying. The, I know during the entire Fuck no. US I'm not fighting for nobody except for my family. 545 sitting members of Congress, only one had a child who was in the services who even stepped foot in the country of Iraq, which is terrifying. So I think that leaders should lead their own soldiers into battle. I'm too moral. I don't want to run the world the way that everyone else runs it. Mm. Do you think, because I think about this a lot, because the reason I want to know who runs the world is because I am in the world. Yes. And therefore, it, their decisions affect me. And I agree with you, the best thing you can do to rebel is to get really rich and build your own I infrastructure and yes. ecosystem of which you are the leader of. But still, those powerful people, whoever they are, make decisions which could ruin my life tomorrow. So I feel like I owe it to myself to figure out where it goes and what got them there if I want to create change. And sometimes I think there's just some evil people you know um, there is one of the best uh, quote that andrew states uh, he says that allow money uh, allow them to manipulate the, to allow your enemy to manipulate you you know how this is when they when when they manipulate you and they they start telling you what where you want where they want you to go what they are saying it allow them to do that don't speak just listen in the end of the day, you're going to know exactly what they're, what they're planning, what they're trying to do, and what exactly they're trying, how to, they're trying to hurt you. And that's how you, try, you can uh, navigate through that. But for first, allow them. And it, it was really good code because you, you, you would never know their intention if you, if you don't allow, if you block them from beginning. You would be ignorant, so you would never know what is, where, where their attention is going. So first, allow them to do that. But be smart. They, they, and their family lineage of thousands of years were evil people. Yes. And then other times, like politics, I think some people go in with good, good intent and then power corrupts and for them to fit within the system, yeah. it changes them. Have you got any thoughts? Yeah, well, it's not just power that corrupts. I think it's actually a lack of understanding of the system. So if we take the American Republican primaries, for example, a lot of people were, were harping on about Vivek Ramaswamy, who I don't dislike. I like him. I like him. But the reason I was a uh, Trump should be president guy, not Vivek, is because Trump is now prepared for the enemy he's facing. He was put into office. He thought, I'm the president. I can do what I want to help the country. He already know and what is going on. Remember Russia Gate, Russia rigged the election. He was fighting this in court for three and a half years. And it's like, oh, well, OK, it turns out Russia didn't need an election. Oh, time's up. And then he was out. I feel like Vivek could have been blindsided with some nonsense claim. I mean, he's sort of, for example, he's of Indian heritage. OK, he becomes president. Maybe India interfered with the election. and He'd be sitting there for three years, three and a half years, fighting this imaginary case, not getting what he needs to do done. And then it's all right, time's up, Vivek, get out. So the reason I was a pro-Trump guy is because it's not just 
about power corrupting people. I think people who get into power maybe don't realize how little power they have in the position that they're fighting for. Whereas Trump now knows the rules. He knows who he's up against. He knows exactly. who in the deep state is trying to take him down. So I think he's the most qualified man for the job. So I don't think anyone necessarily gets corrupted. I think that the suits knock on the door and sit down and say, oh, congratulations, prime minister. Well, this is the way it works. And if you don't like it, shut up. That's mm. what I think. Yeah, so it's interesting you talk about the, the guy in a band who had a new model of the political yeah. system. It was terrible, by the way. Yeah. I looked it over. Right, okay. <laughs> but the political system surely is broken. It's not a democracy. It's not of the people, for the people. So, and does it not take a naive, delusional human to change? Yes, uh, it's not by the, it's not of the people, for the people. It's uh, of the money, for the money. And that's the way it works in, I think, most political systems. Most democracies, it's, it's all about the money. And I don't think countries like our country, you're British, of course, mm. really have a chance of any radical change. I really see it, and I see that both parties are center, one center right, one center left. They're basically the same. They, they uh, argue about tiny little minor differences in, in and of themselves. But I think money controls both parties. And in the United States and some other countries in the world, you can have a maverick who comes along with a new idea, a new way of doing things, a new way of saying things, and he can be swept into, off in, into office from, from relative obscurity. Then he chooses the other people in charge. Systems like England are the scariest because for all those watching who don't know this, the way that the UK elections work is there's hundreds of mini elections for each member of parliament, and then the party that wins the most seats in parliament gets to form a government, and then they select their prime minister from the people who are sitting in the house. Mm -hmm. So yeah, nobody can come along, nobody, no. not anybody, and just say, I've got a new way of doing things, please vote for me. Vote for me where? What, Coventry South, Luton North? Then you're a member of parliament. You have no power. You're not directing the government. They're not going to form a government from you. So I look at you know what people like Lawrence Fox are doing with the Reform Party and stuff, and I'm just thinking, I'd love, I'd love, not because I necessarily adore what the Reform Party stand for, but I want new faces in our government and I want new people sitting in those chairs. And I'd love the Reform Party to even find enough people to run in every single little local election in the first past the post system to absolutely you know, sweep the numbers, get 200 people sitting in, 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 in the Houses of Parliament. And at least then we have a new way of doing things, but it can't happen. If, if Lawrence Fox or any of these people running for the Reclaim Party, even, uh, the, is it Reform? Reform Party, mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. Even get their single seat, it's gonna be Labour or Conservative who form the government, who have their Prime Minister. And there hasn't been a revolution in British politics since the, the, I guess the invention of the Labour Party when they first came around. So it's scary and it's sad, and I, I don't think there's any way of fixing some countries. And England is mo most broken, to answer your, your question mm. about is it broken. It's more broken in places like England than it is in the United States. Yeah, that's scary. Because the paradox that comes to mind is it's broken, it's been broken for so long, there's nothing you can do about it, sort yourself out. Yeah. If we don't stand up and fight against it, it will never change, so we manifest the lack of change. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, mm. absolutely. But there's nobody who I've seen, even from people who I like, like Nigel Farage, who can actually garner that kind of numbers behind them. Oh, Nigel, to get I think done. he can now. Do you think he can? I mean, I know him really well. He's been on the show a few times. I think he's awesome. He's powerful now. I, I think he's, he's more powerful than Rishi now. Yeah, well, I hope so. Yeah. And, and Nigel was awesome. So what does he do? Does he rejoin the Conservative Party and try to fight his position within the party to get himself to the prime minister position? That is the best, I think, course of action for, for Mr. Farage, because forming a new party, I mean, UKIP was, had a, it was a one policy party, and that now is, is, is finished and well done to him. But forming a new party and trying to get 200, 300 people to all win seats, I, I just don't think it's possible. Mm. So I'd like to see someone who can garner the kind of numbers to win a sweeping general election. And I, personally, I don't think Nigel Farage could do it. I think mm. his only way in is through the Conservatives, which is sad because mm. he's uh, he cares about England. Mm. He really cares about England and he's a really good guy. Mm. In my opinion, I, you know him, I don't. Mm. Mm, I'd agree. <laughs> <laughs> so we have another paradox that exists and that's one about money because you've essentially said that money corrupts. Yes. But you're rich as and you love money. <laughs> <laughs> so, I am rich as f***.
Thank you. But you're, yeah. not, you're not doing too bad yourself either, are you, Rob? I don't I, know. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing all right. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you exist in that paradox? How do you not let, let it corrupt you? Uh, you know, it's a very, I don't think money or power corrupt moral people. I think they, they, they bring out more of who you really are. You know? yeah, yeah, I true. didn't run a charity when I was 21 because I had no money. Now I do because I have money. Uh, I did, my mom still worked a job when I was 21. Now she doesn't because I have money. The, even the people who follow me around, I, I just had lunch now, I tip 100% at every restaurant I go to because I have money. I'm a kind person and money allows you to do more of the things that you enjoy. So if you meet someone who seems like a good down-to-earth guy who then wins the lottery and he starts talking down to people and being dismissive... And, and just who he is, who he, he was before. He's been corrupted. I think that's who he really was. Exactly. But you can't act that way in a position of poverty. I feel like it reveals your true character. Mm. So how do you stop money from corrupting people? I guess the answer is you don't. You have good people and bad people. And I wish the world was set up in a way that it was easier for the good people to get rich. You know, rather than you know the evil, cutthroat, vindictive people, because capitalism is a system where it's easier if you're cutthroat to get rich than if you're kind and moral. I think. Yeah, I'd agree. Although, do you think we even have capitalism anymore? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's tricky. I mean, it, it, capitalism is a system. For capitalism to be real, money has to be real. Money has to be backed by something other than a military that's willing to like invade every single country, saying no names, and you know, <laughs> and, and overthrow their leaders when they don't like using their currency. So, for capitalism to be real, money has to be real. Pers personal ownership of wealth has to be real. What does your bank balance even mean? Nothing. Is it backed by gold or silver or anything? No. I mean, the only way to actually have wealth is to accumulate things that are expensive. So. I mean, if you own a bunch of properties, a bunch of cars, a bunch of gold, then you do have some wealth. But, you know, capitalism means that every single intermediary exchange between goods and services is all cyberspace, smoke and mirrors, nothing. So I guess in a way we don't have capitalism. Mm. But so I, don't, I don't know what to do about that besides, you know, keep, keep making as much of this money as I can and keep buying real things. Mm. So, well, it sounds like you do because that sound, you said that flippantly, but I think it was wise. You use the system of capitalism and this thing that isn't real money, and then you convert it into real assets that is real money. Well, yeah, and that's, and that's how you get rich. And that's exactly what the evil people do as well. That's what evil people do as well. If you're a bank and you can print money out of thin air, well, what the banks do is take everyone's money and convert it into assets. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Or they take everyone's assets. So a bank will, as you know, but well, the, the viewers at home may not know, the bank will say, "I am the bank, and I offer a mortgage to." Everyone in this studio right now, 10 people, 10 mortgages, you all bought your homes, you know what your job is, you know what your salaries are, and you're all paying me a certain amount of money back on these loans I give you. Okay, cool. Well, interest rates go, go up. You've got some variable interest rates on your mortgages. Then suddenly, I personally crash the, the, the property market and the value of all your houses go down. And I start saying, oh, well, your loans are too big, blah, blah. I'm going to default you on all these loans. I'm going to take all your houses. What's happened? A bunch of money has moved around, which doesn't mean anything, and I have 10 houses, your houses, and, and you're all homeless. And they didn't have to earn their money, exactly. they created it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. they printed it <laughs> out of thin air yeah. for you to work and do the labor to get these houses. Now they're all mine. None of you have houses, the whole street is mine. So evil people do it, <laughs> evil people do it, absolutely. They, uh, they don't even need to do any work or come up with mm. any good ideas to get everyone's assets. Farmland, it's all, it's all going into the hands of these people. Mm. And it's it's a scary future to look to look into. Mm. Huge news, years in the making. My brand new book that my publishers refuse to publish, Money Matrix. Beat the money system and build generational wealth. Understand the three main ways that the banks productize you and make money from you. You'll be able to turn that system against itself, build generational wealth and multiple streams of recurring income. It's all at moneymatrix.cash. And if you're quick, the first few hundred registrants and buyers will receive many special bonuses from me. The brand new Money Maker Summit three-day special event. Meet me at a champagne reception. Meet me at a multi-millionaire networking dinner. Go now, moneymatrix.cash. This is huge. So part of my mission, because my mission is to help as many people on the planet get better financial knowledge, is to learn what the system does. Because actually, take morality out of it. Yes, it's pretty f***ing smart. Yeah, no, no, it is. It, it's we, genius. I mean, if I could sell you a money printer that you could have in your office where you could just print money, you, oh. would, you wouldn't tell me to f*** off, would you? No, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd buy it at whatever cost. I'd, yeah. I'd buy it for all that I have because then I'm rich forever. Yeah. yeah. So, um, 
I guess I'm trying to help people understand the, th the, the challenge for people is the system is really smart and it makes money out of you, but it doesn't want you to know how it makes money out of you because once it's exposed, you can reject it and make your own money like it makes money from you. Exactly. And also, where do you get your education from? The system. The system you create, <laughs> so, yeah. So that's Propaganda. The, that's yeah. the tricky part. I mean, people joke about this all the time. Like, you, in school, I'm not against learning any of the stuff we learn in school. Pythagorean theorem, very useful if you want to be even a, a, a carpenter. Very useful stuff. Mm. How flowers work, I still remember that to this day. It's very interesting. People should know about the world around them, and people should learn these things. But, you know, what is money? How do loans work? How would a mortgage work? Like, very basic stuff. You know, I remember Not taking a class called Life Skills. Now, I went to British school. It was called Life Skills back in my day. And what the hell did we learn in Life Skills? The fact that I don't remember, I think, I think yeah. speaks volumes. It speaks more than if I could give you an example. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it's very scary that the system is in charge of your education and people don't seem to be learning the most basic things about how any of this works. Mm. And the paradox of that is people like yourself and Andrew, who are teaching this stuff, are starting to become very powerful. Uh, yes, indeed we are. Powerful and also in jail. So, <laughs> <laughs> interesting how that works. You know, I, I can't say too much on the topic, but it's very interesting when you start upsetting the people who've been running this scam for hundreds of years uh, and upsetting the system, I guess, that we're all a part of, that out of nowhere, I mean, I mean, Elon Musk just got hit with a bunch of criminal charges. They're trying to put Donald Trump in jail. Mm. I was in jail. I there probably even won't be a trial, but they certainly screwed with me for a, a couple years. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a back off warning, I guess. It's a do not touch. And I don't know what else to do besides continue doing what I'm doing because you know, the success stories of people who you know, subscribe to the, the online school that we run or, the, or read your books, the success stories keep you going. It's like, okay, this young man's now making money because of something I've taught him. Screw it, send me to jail. Like, mm. <laughs> what else can I do? I can't quit. So do you think you were in jail because of things you did or were you in jail because of the crossfire from Andrew? It's tricky. I mean, when you try to use people's pasts against them, everyone knows my past. I've talked about it very openly on the internet. I mean, I used to run a webcam studio. I used to be a serial womanizer. So I mean, there's lots of, lots of women in my past. So it's a very easy attack factor. Let's throw him in jail and talk to all his exes. Luckily, I've always been a gentleman and none of my exes said anything bad about me. Uh, zero girls who ever worked at my studios are involved in the current case, by the way. People on the Twitter keep trying to make that connection. Oh, he said he ran webcam studios. Excuse me, there are tens of thousands of OnlyFans management agencies in this world now. Who controls them? Arrest all them for human trafficking. The point is it's not illegal. Immoral? Sure. Uh, good for society? Probably not. But it's a completely legal business, and that's not connected with my case at all. What they're trying to do is talk to all my exes and say, I don't know, has he ever hurt you? Luckily, I've always been a good guy, so I looked like I was easy to attack. The case hasn't really formulated the way they wanted because my past was much cleaner than they thought. Never tried any drugs, never did anything illegal. So uh, it's hard to say whose fault it was that I was in jail. The way I lived didn't contribute to me looking like a saint. But I also do believe if Andrew had not got so big or so popular, that this wouldn't have happened. It's it true. wouldn't happen. It wouldn't have been worth anyone's time. Yeah. If Andrew had never become so wealthy and so popular and so listened to, it would not have been worth anyone's time to be calling 200 of my ex-girlfriends. It doesn't make any sense. Why do that? For what? You're not going to get money out of it. You're not going to get headlines out of it. You're not going to look like a hero. I'm just Joe Schmo. So I guess it's both of our fault. <laughs> it's both of our fault, and we were in jail together, and that's the way I like it. So yeah. Fine by me. <laughs> So we'll come back to that in a minute, but I just want to pull out something you said, which is really interesting. You said a womanizer and a gentleman. Yeah. So, so when you said you were a womanizer, but you're a gentleman, to me a womanizer isn't a gentleman, so what's a womanizer? Um, so I'm talking about, look, I, I, I come from a very bad part of England. You know where I come from, the council estate from Luton. Not far from me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not fair. <enough. laughs> they're not, they're, it's not a good area, and I made money uh, very slowly, I guess, and I, I've experienced all the different wealth brackets on the way up. And, you know, you give a young man in his mid-twenties, or I think I was just past my mid-twenties when I first became a millionaire. You know, I'm driving around in a Lamborghini. I'm living in uh, first London, then Slovakia, then Romania. There's lots of pretty girls around. Of course, of course, I met loads of women. 
course I met loads of women. That's what you get. It's like giving a, a, a chimpanzee a machine gun. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> of course that's what I was going to do. Uh, very, very, I live a very different lifestyle now, but that's, that's the, what, what could I have done? I'd like, I look back on it like, oh, I shouldn't have acted that way. But no one at the time could have told me. Even my future self couldn't go back in time at 26 and say, Tristan, it's, it's Saturday night. Don't go to the club and don't meet any women. I wouldn't have listened. I wouldn't have listened. So uh, when, I mean, when I say a womanizer and a gentleman, what I mean is, you know, I, I met a lot of women, dated a lot of women, took a lot of women to, to bed, but I never mistreated any woman. So, you know, pick them up in your car, take them out to dinner, buy them flowers, take them home, do this two or three times, you know, and the relationship kind of fades into nothing and it's on to the next one. So, but those women, when contacted by the authorities, had nothing bad to say about me. Nothing, certainly nothing illegal I ever did. They didn't even want to lie for the intention of trying to extort me. Everyone they called said I was a nice guy. So, yeah, I was a womanizer and a gentleman. Never mistreated anybody. Mm. Broke a few hearts, but had mine broken a couple times along the way too, so. Is that not it's, what it's life fair. is called? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. No matter what you do, that's what happens. Yeah. So how does a woman keep a man like Tristan Tate? Oh, that's incredibly tricky. I didn't actually expect these kind of questions. How does a woman keep a man like Tristan Tate? You know, I, I'm going to cop out and give a really crappy answer to this, and you're not going to be entertained by it. I don't believe I could describe my perfect woman, because when I look at all of my exes and the women who I was in love with and the women who I did have serious relationships with, they never fit one exact type, whether it be in looks or personality or the, you know, the, their charms, their jobs, education levels. There was, there was no real correlation I can draw. It was just a feeling I got from them. You don't have to be my type to be my type. I can describe the physically perfect woman if, if I like. I mean, I like tall, kind of slim model types, but you know, not all of my exes fit into that, and it's not just about looks. I think they just gave me something, a really good feeling I had around them. They, they, they brought me peace. They didn't fight with me, they didn't argue with me, they didn't make Basically scandals peace. or blow my phone up or cause arguments over stupid little things. Like, I'm a businessman and you understand what that's like. I'm at war all the time, 24-7. I'm operating at 99% stress level, you know, 365 days a year. So if you want to add 1% stress to my life each day, that's just not doable. No one can operate at 100% stress level. Nobody can. And people... I guess my exes and, and the girls who I, who I really liked just were very, very nice. Very nice, very kind, very kind of emotionally giving people. Mm. I think that's how you keep a man like me. Mm. Do you think you will ever settle down? Yeah, I think I will. I look at the trajectory of my life and will I be married in the next couple of years? Who knows? Prenup, obviously, Jesus Christ. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's certainly going that direction. I, I feel like as a man who's lived this kind of strange, eclectic life, you go through these phases and you get bored of certain things. Now it's there's good. nothing I want to do less than go out seven days a week and meet three new women in those seven days. Like, Jesus, really? All the drinks, all the hangovers, I can't be bothered with that. So I have been told by people we both mutually know, you still like a good drink. Oh, you? I do like a good drink. <laughs> I love a good drink, but it's very different now. Now it's like, I'm sitting around with my friends, let, let's drink six bottles of whiskey. It's not like, let's Just go out. Well, it depends. If there's three of us, it's only two, two bottles <laughs> per man, you know? It's not that bad. So yeah, I still do love a drink, and I built up a tolerance over the years, but uh, it's not part we of drink my too much, recreation in terms of going out and making the kind of parties. It's more <laughs> sitting around discussing history and politics with my friends, playing chess, playing cards, drinking whiskey. That, that's when I like a drink now. Mm. So it's shifted. And I'm bored of the previous stages of my life. You know, I'm, I'm literally bored of them. So settling down, I think, will probably happen. Yeah. Sooner mm. rather than later, but I, I can't really say anymore because I have no certain answers. Mm. Do you think, like being with hundreds of women comes from a f place of low Thousands worth. Right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Cut, edit, <laughs> Tristan. Do you think being I mean, with tens of millions of women, <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's sometimes trying to fill a void in your own soul or fill up some empty? Yeah, but yeah, well, this is a good question because most of the people, when they have a lot of money, they try to fill up the holes that they have in their soul, you know? And um, 
you can fill it with alcohol with women with uh, with cars with houses you know but that's it you you feel in the the whole the soul the soul doesn't feel like that you cannot uh, feed your soul like that. It's, it's impossible if you want to feed your soul it's going to be spiritual it's impossible to feed your soul with uh, women alcohol and shit like that no it's impossible if you want to feed really your soul spiritual if you are a Christian, be a good one. If you are a Muslim, be a good one. If you are Jewish, be a good one. Be a religious one. That's how you're gonna feed your spiritual. I'm talking about all, but I'm, as me, I'm talking about uh, being Muslim. I will say, if you want to uh, feed your soul, do your prayer. Uh, yes, like I'm saying, do your prayer. Uh, be faithful. Don't go don't drink alcohol don't like he said womanize don't go to a lot of women don't cheat be be truthful that's there. i've heard that before and the answer is yes in some people yes in some people so when i say i like drinking alcohol with my friends because it enhances our conversations about history and politics and makes the card games more fun also there are people who use alcohol to fill a hole in their soul I don't have a hole in my soul. Okay, so that's when good, I was then. running around meeting a bunch of beautiful women, I come from a, ta a time when I was a nightclub bodyguard in London, one of the doormen, and I'd like see these millionaires with all these beautiful girls, and I couldn't talk to them. One, I was at work. Two, like I made a hundred pounds a day. They probably this kind of girl probably wasn't interested in hanging out with me. So it, it didn't come from a, a point of trying to fill my soul with anything. I just enjoyed doing it. I just enjoyed meeting new women, I enjoyed hanging out with them. It wasn't just the sexual side of things. I enjoyed taking them to dinner, having them on my arm, going to the theater, going to the ballet. It was nice. Uh, I wasn't trying to fill a hole in my soul, but I do 100% agree that some people are trying to do that. But the but, same could be said with alcohol. Some, same could be said with many things. Mm. Did I hear you say you were glad you went to jail? Did I say that? Yeah, I probably said that. So when I say did I, I know you did because yeah. I saw it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, well, I, I think I've said it twice. One, I'm glad I went to jail with Andrew. I'm glad he wasn't sent to jail without me because that would have been a, a travesty. It's, it's already a travesty of justice as it is, but at least send me with him, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, glad I went to jail. Yes. Yes, I'd never been to jail. And... I tried to think into the future and look back at my life as a 65, 70 year old man. Although being in jail at the time bothered me a lot. Even now that I'm out, God knows if they'll send me back. It, hopefully not, it doesn't look like it. But it, I think it was a very interesting chapter of my life. This is certainly, for a three month period, one of the foundational stories that will be told about me and Andrew in the, in the decades to come. The, the time that we were thrown in prison unjustly. So even though it was only three months of, of time, yeah, I'm glad I went. It was a test of character. I passed the test of character to myself and to God, to no one else, because obviously no one else was watching. And yeah, I think one day when I, when I write my autobiography, it's gonna be a very interesting three or four chapters. So I'm glad I went through it. I mean, it was January, February, and March of 2023. What would I have done anyway? Got, went skiing. I can't ski. I just sit in the ski resort drinking whiskey trying to you know, watch everyone else do the skiing and sit by the fireplace. What would I have really done that could have taught me more than going to jail? So what were the, what were the benefits of going to jail? Oh, I mean, there were basically no benefits in that, in that <laughs> regard. Well, there weren't any luxurious benefits, but there were character no. benefits. Yes, it didn't, it didn't change me, but it confirmed to me all the things I already thought about myself. Now I know them about myself. So More than, you know, surely going from thinking about yourself to knowing yourself is f***ing powerful. It right? is. It absolutely yeah. is. You know, I'm the kind of guy and I'm, I feel like I can handle any situation. If I can handle anything, I'm Tristan Tate. And I've been saying this for years and I've been through some difficult situations in my life. But being picked up from just after Christmas Day in your fancy clothes and you're taken down to a police station. They're like, oh, we're searching your house for human trafficking. I'm like, well, good. There's no one in my house. There's no drugs in my house. Nothing. They searched my house. There's okay. Then the handcuffs went on, they put me in jail, and they said, okay, you'll be here at least 24 hours. And that went on for 92 days. So it was a mentally tough situation to be in. And yeah, I thought, I'm Tristan Tate, I can handle any situation. Now I'm like, yeah, I can handle any situation. So having thoughts about who I was and confirming who I was, I guess, is the biggest thing I got out of it. Mm. So I talked to quite a lot to Andrew lead, leading up to this. Okay. And one thing he said to me was,
stuff with myself, Rob, because there's things I really want to say that I haven't said. Yeah. And lawyers, whatever reasons. Is there anything about the case that you haven't said that you can say? Is there anything I haven't said that I can say? No, there's things I haven't said that I'd really love to say. But you I'd can't really say. love to say, no, I, I, can't, I can't put them out yeah. right now. I Does will that say not that frustrate you a little bit. Yeah. But I know that my time is going to come. And one day, everybody, whether they find me guilty on zero evidence and put me in jail or not, as soon as the case is over, the entire world is going to know exactly why this happened. Why who, did it happen? Who set the dogs on me? What the dogs' names were? Like, let's just put it that way. Um, so you know the dogs' names? And, and, the, and, the, and the handler who let them off the, off the chain. Right. Uh, I and that's what you can't say? Well, it's one of the things I can't say. Yeah. I, can't, I, can't, I literally wish I could say it, and yeah. I, can't, I can't say anything right now. But when the case is over, uh, I won't even have to say anything. Everyone, everything is going to be on the table, and everybody will be able to look. And I think everyone's going to be very, very shocked at the process that's led me here. I mean, I was falsely accused originally one year and nine months ago. One year and nine months. I was arrested one year and one month ago. I'm still under a form of arrest now. I'm still under arrest now. And uh, yeah, the fact that this has lasted so long is the big mystery. That's the big mystery. Everyone's like, well, the people who like me are quite right in saying, if he was guilty of human trafficking, they'd have locked him up and convicted him and put him in jail by now, because that's what the people who attacked me wanted to do. And the people who hate me are actually wrong in saying, oh, well, it's still going on because they're going to find him guilty eventually. No one is ever, what, two years from the initial event, still there's not even a decision about if there will be a trial or not. That decision hasn't been made. So it's a very long time in my life, and the reason why it took so long is going to be the big wow moment. Well, because I was just going to ask you, is it taking so long part of the process that, yeah, of what they want that's, to that, achieve? Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. And how they've done it is going to be the mind-blowing part when everyone's like, oh, wow. Can I, wow. Come, back, can I come back to Romania for that one, then? Yeah, <laughs> come sure. and have another chat with you. I've been in Romania a while. When this is over, let's meet in Dubai. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, so <laughs> I'll, co I'll come to you. you yeah, know? yeah. But that's going to be the mind-blowing moment. How it was done, how it was orchestrated to last so long, and who did it? That's going to be the interesting part. That is the like, yeah. filthiest of cliffhangers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, this video, this uh, interview, the one he did with Andrew Tate and the one he did with Tristan Tate, he didn't go so viral because I don't understand why, even though it was really interesting, especially with Andrew Tate that I heard, it was really interesting, but it didn't go that viral. It didn't get that many click. He didn't get that many views. So the, the, the question is why? And this one also, if, if I wasn't... Um, if I don't watch, for example, for, from time to time their stuff, it will never appear in my uh, YouTube to, as a recommendation. So, why? The question is why? <laughs> why they didn't go? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and I'll, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't push any harder than that. I've got to push a bit. I've got to do my job. I appreciate I, it. But, yeah, I yeah. appreciate it. Um, does anything shock you about your rise to infamy? I would actually correct your question, because we are infamous. 100%. But we're also heroes to a, to a lot, a massive percentage of a generation. So we are infamous, but we're also very, very well liked. Uh, depends who you're asking. But uh, in terms of the state hating me, etc., like the old pirates were, you know, we are infamous in that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm very surprised at how evil they've painted. You know, uh, Hating a people, I ha I hating a guy or something, or disliking, I would not say hating because I don't like the word hating. I would say disliking a guy. So disliking a guy with not understanding why you dislike this guy and not having a conversation with him or not even listening to what he had to say or what he had to say and watch it in a full, like a full context. Like one, if he spoke for one hour, listen to the one hour and then make your jump to your conclusion and say, this guy is, I, I, I don't accept his moral, is against everything and his moral is against my moral. If you jump to this conclusion by listening to what all he had to say, it, it's understandable. But if you just 
with no reason you heard a friend or you heard someone like oh this guy is an asshole oh this guy is an asshole and you keep going with the same words that your friends said and it's obviously your friend didn't check even one minute of what he said or something like that's what i don't like but if you dislike him for reason of your moral okay acceptable but i would like to say if it, there is no point of you disliking or liking somebody only if he's against your moral if he's against your moral then okay it's not for me i don't want to listen to you i don't accept what i have you have to say but I hate you no i don't hate you i hate nobody i just dislike you. the only thing we hate is the, uh, is the devil i guess my brother me by extension i like to think of myself as a very good person and my brother again is a very good person a very moral person a very kind person a very charitable person a very a person who's always willing to help who's always to lift always willing to lift others up always willing to you know take my time to you know teach people lessons in life that may benefit them and i've always seen myself and my brother this way so when i look at the old videos of him like yeah you know if a girl attacked me with a machete i just i keto the machete out of her hand and but i don't look at the stupid old videos and they're like Andrew Tate attacks women with machetes. I'm like, how, first of all, how dishonest is this? First of all, how dishonest is this to find one clip from a, people who've been producing content on the internet now, 11 years, and say that this is the core of his message, attack people with machetes. He was talking about self-defense. It was a joke. It's stupid. But that's the core of his message. It's it was, the rise to infamy hasn't surprised me from the moment I realized how dishonest the mainstream media are. Once I saw how dishonest they could be about him, now I'm like, okay, say whatever you like about me. I don't know. Human trafficker, murderer, misogynist. I, you can say whatever you like about me now, and I will not be shocked. I will not be surprised because I know how evil they are and how dishonest they really are. Because the core of Andrew's message, and you're obviously someone who, who knows this, I'd like to think, is uh, be better, do better, treat others well, you know, go to the mosque. That's Andrew's message. I'm not, I'm not Muslim myself, but that's the core of Andrew's message. So he's not an evil person. The rise to infamy has been a shock, an absolute shock, because I was like, why on earth would they want to lie about someone so obviously and so blatantly, but also in such a horrible way, you know? Mm. I, I, it doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect Andrew, but, you know, our mother. We don't need that. People keep thinking that her sons are arch criminals who kidnap people and stab people with machetes like especially at a time when in the uk every single day some, someone is in fact stabbed with a machete and these people are unnamed mm. but andrew's joke from 10 years ago is the height of machete madness it's very strange mm. but you know why now oh now i know why <laughs> yeah of course i know <laughs> yeah. very obvious yeah wow what's the story you've never told or a secret you've never shared He want to use the same question that he said, asks Andrew Tate to see if he have any secret because Andrew he he really said something. It was it was a long time ago, but it was at the same time funny but real. Hmm, a story I've never told or a secret I've never shared. I'm a very open person. I don't really have. I know it sounds like I'm being defensive. I don't really have any any stories I wouldn't tell or any secrets I wouldn't share. I'm not maybe you just haven't had the opportunity. We, we, I think we've got one from Andrew. There must be something in your life that's just not come out yet. Hmm. Or something you believe you don't talk about much, maybe because of the types of interviews you do. And if you did a different type of interview, you might, we might get to know something about you. That's a tricky question. That's a tricky question. I can tell you things about me that people think that aren't accurate, and, I'm all, and I, I haven't had a chance to clear them up. I mean, I can name a few things. Please. Yeah. Uh, people always assume that me and Andrew, I don't know why, they group us in with this, this online community of what they call red pillars, and they believe that I hate women and I look down on women. That, that is actually one of the most offensive things that anyone can say about me, when really I don't hate any woman. I don't care if a woman is a actress or if a woman is a prostitute or if a woman is a virgin or a nun I don't hate any of them and the fact that you can say that I do means that you listen to nothing that I say obviously don't marry a porn star but porn stars exist because they fulfill a role in society don't marry a prostitute but prostitutes exist because they serve a role in society I'm, I'm actually tired of the red pill community who they're always trying to group me in with trying to change women. They get a bunch of girls who are promiscuous on a panel and they say, yeah, you should act like wives and you should, no, they shouldn't. No, no, no. 
marry the wives. The wives aren't sitting on your podcasts. Let them do their thing and stop hating on everybody. Stop being so rude towards women. So I think the fact that I, I appreciate women and don't hate them is one of the most annoying rumors about me that I never ever get the chance to clear up. But, well, there it is. That, that really offends me when people say that I hate women. Mm. Well, hopefully this clears it up. Oh, we'll see. I don't know. But the stories about me, secrets about me, I don't have any secrets. I don't have any secrets. I've got loads and loads of cool stories because every man has cool stories. And I've got, I've got hundreds of cool stories. But, <laughs> you know, I don't know. What's your coolest to... story? My coolest story? Um, I've got an embarrassing story. What's your most embarrassing story? Uh, I've, got, I've got a very embarrassing story. Yeah. Now, I've never told it on a podcast. So okay. if, you, if, you, if you have three minutes, I'll, I'll tell you this story. I flew here for you, so okay. I have more than three Wonderful, minutes. wonderful. I'll, I'll tell you this story, because it's, it's actually the most embarrassing time in my life, and it's actually a lesson I learned. So I'm going to turn this around to a lesson for young men about having a big ego and acting like you're the man when you're clearly not. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, so long story short, I was here in Bucharest about six or seven years ago. I just moved here. And a friend of mine came to visit from New York City. So he'd taken me out in New York before, so I thought, ah, oh, well, he's in Bucharest, I'm going to show him a good time. And the nightlife here is absolutely amazing, so I booked the best table, and I needed some women around. I don't pay for women. People assume I do because I'm rich. I don't. So I called every girl I know who I'm friends with, and I said, bring some of your friends to this table. So I called too many, and about 50 different women turn up, all looking their absolute best. I'm there with this guy, and he's mind blown. And my ex shows up, a girl I used to date. And she looks incredible. She did it on purpose to get me, to trick me. <laughs> she turns up looking like a million dollars, absolutely gorgeous. I'm like, why did I stop talking to her? Am I stupid? So by coincidence, my friend, we'll call him James for this part. I'm not going to name him. My friend James starts talking to this girl's friend. And I'm like, oh, good. Boom. Done deal. He likes her friend. I'm going to get back with her. Everything's going to work out perfectly fine. So because I had people visiting my house, I decided to go to a hotel to get a hotel room for me and my girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend, and a hotel room for them too, and we'd stay there tonight and get back to my house in the morning. So here's where, you know the Bible said, pride cometh before the fall. So I thought I was the man. I turn up at this hotel, beautiful woman on my arm, and the guy, I mean, a little bit rude, gives me this piece of paper for tourists to fill out, some English language piece of paper for the government to measure tourism information. I was like, bro, I live here. I speak your language, I live here, I don't need to fill that out, I'm not a tourist. He goes, do you have a Romanian passport? I said, no. He goes, you have to fill it in. I said, bro, just give me the rooms. Here's the money. Let's go. No, 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 no. You can't have the rooms until you and him fill these in. So I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake. So I thought I was the man at this point. I said, all right, get the pen. Name, Captain Dickhead. Pass passport number, one, two, three, four, five, six. Boom, money. Give me the keys. OK, cool. You took my bits of paper. So I go upstairs. It's now getting to 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm drunk. She's drunk. Everyone's drunk. So we start kissing, making out, and she's like, oh, do you have protection? I'm like, well, I don't. It's at my house, obviously. We're in a random hotel. So she says, okay. And I said, yeah, fine. We won't sleep together tonight, no problem at all. So we sit there talking for another two hours. It gets to about 6.30 in the morning. We drank everything in the minibar, from the Romanian palinka to the whiskey to the vodka. <laughs> so she starts climbing on top of me, kissing me again, taking my shirt off, this kind of stuff. And we get down to, like, I'm in my underwear, and she's like, do you have protection? I'm like, but you know I don't. So, and then I had this bright idea. I said, James will have some. I know James will have some. So I run out of the hotel room in my underwear, go into the hallway, walk down the, uh, the uh, hallway, knock on James's door, who's an American, and I hear a Romanian man say, who's that knocking on the door? So I run around the corner, terrified, because I think I'm going to call him in my underwear. So I'm hiding around the corner, still got a rock hard on, in my underwear, <laughs> and I look around the corner, and I'm like, fuck, I don't know what James's room is. But then I realize, I don't know what room I just came out of. And the hallway all looks the same. Red carpet, red doors. So I'm creeping down this hallway going, psst, James, psst, the girl's name. I'm not, not going to say it on the podcast. And no one comes out to save me. So it's 7 o'clock in the morning. Sun's coming up. Rock hard on in my pants, in my underwear. I get in the elevator. I'm going down the stairs. <laughs> and uh, obviously the door opens to a group of 40 Chinese tourists with cameras around their necks. I'm standing there swaying, giving them the old don't take pictures of me face. So I turned the corner, and I was like, bro, bro, what room number am I in? I kid you not, this man shuffles his papers, looks me dead in the eye, and goes, so you must be Captain Dead. <laughs> <laughs> I've never felt more ashamed in my life. He didn't even let me off. I'm like, yes, passport number one, two, three, four, five. 
Yeah, bro, that's me. Room 406. I never forgot the number to this day. <laughs> Most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me. So, young man, listen. Put your egos aside <laughs> and just fill out the bits of paper when the hotel guy asks you to because that was a horrible story. I think if you wrote that scene into a movie, they'd think it was fake. But, uh, yeah, true story. Well, there you go. An embarrassing, you. an embarrassing story I've now shared with the world, courtesy of, of Mr. Rob Moore. Thank you for sharing. No problem. I'm a visual guy, so there's still some things going on <laughs> in my head there. Yeah. What scares you the most? Um, I don't... I, I wouldn't openly say I'm scared of anything. Like, I'm not scared of things. I don't swim in oceans. I almost got killed by a fish once. Long story. So I don't swim in oceans. I'll jump. Saying a shark would sound better, wouldn't it? No, it wasn't. Fish. Oh, yeah. Fish. yeah fish. I almost got killed by a fish. <laughs> that should be the story. It is a very good story. I should share it with you one time. But uh, yeah, a fish almost killed me, basically. So I don't go in oceans. I mean, obviously, everyone on Earth can say, oh, I'm scared of my mom dying and, you know, inevitable things that will eventually happen to all of us, sadly. Mm. But do I really sit around scared of anything? For example, I'm not scared of going to jail right now. I don't operate in the realm of fear. Like, the, God's going to deal me the cards that he's going to deal me, and that's going to be it. So not, heights, nothing. No, nothing. I'm not scared of anything. I wouldn't parachute jump. I don't fly. In. You know, it's like, you have to understand also in the same time, like, uh, I'm also, again, I'm speaking about perspective of a Muslim guy. Uh, your life is in the hand of Allah. That's 100% sure. So it's like, you need to have full uh, trust in Allah, 100% trust in Allah. Why I'm saying this? Because in every room you're going to enter when you have full trust of Allah. And you you should have a full trust in it. Every room you enter or everything going to happen to you, it, 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 you understand that this is, this is from Allah. It's a test or not. This is came from Allah. It's already written. So basically, if it's already written, you, you're not... You cannot change much if it's already written. You, you this day, you, this is this, and this is this. It was already written. When you put that in your mind, like everything is already written, uh, nothing I can do about it. So just get into to the room, and what happened happened, and that's it's gonna give you a little bit peace. In helicopters, but I wouldn't say I'm. Why, why don't you fly in helicopters? Statistics. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, I, I I got two pilots licenses and then stopped. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I, you know the statistics. Yeah, no, the statistics. They're very bad. And yeah. am I scared of helicopters, though? No. I wouldn't use that word. But there are things I don't do. Don't swim in deep oceans. Don't fly in helicopters. I wouldn't bungee jump or skydive just because, you know, some little Indonesian man whose job it is to hold a big rubber band over a bridge in a river. I'm like, do I? I've worked so hard my entire life, and now I'm just going to leave it in the hands of this rubber band guy? Like, <laughs> no. I'd rather not. Could I do it? 100% guarantee of safety. Could I do it? Yeah, of course. But there are no 100% mm. guarantees. No, I'm not scared of anything. A Andrew, um, the first time I had him on my show and then after that yeah. got to know him, was pretty convinced he was going to be assassinated. We just talked about it again. And, you know, he sort of danced away from it by saying, I'm being digitally assassinated. Mm. Are you not scared of that? Of Andrew getting Andrew assassinated? being assassinated. I mean, he thinks that's a, a thing. Oh. Do I think it's a possibility? Yeah. Maybe. Yes, I do. do that, I, does that scare I, you? Well, the idea of... Do you have a brother? No, I don't. No, you don't. Do you have a sister? Yes. The idea of your sister dying is not pleasant. No. So, but do you wake up every day scared of the fact that she might die? No, so no. I'm not... Like, I understand Andrew's security concerns, but it's one of those... I mean, if they... I'm everywhere with him. If they, you know, blow us up, I'm getting blown up too, I guess. If they open a spray of bullets, I'm probably going to catch a few. Am I scared of it happening? No. I, I've done my best to protect myself. I'm very careful about my locations, where I am. I've got security guards. I've done all I can do. And I don't think Andrew's going to get assassinated. I feel like when he talks about his three steps, first they cancel you, then they throw you in jail, then they assassinate you thing, he's completely correct. I feel like there was a time when Andrew was public enemy number one. Everyone was making this huge deal around Andrew Tate. And uh, going to jail, I guess, trying to tarnish our name has at least given them satisfaction he's no longer the public enemy number one yeah that's and true the 2024 elections coming up there are going to be a lot more people who say a lot more things that are dangerous to the establishments and the people who are really in charge and yeah i, I don't think that andrew's going to be on their hit list mm. Would, do i want him to get assassinated no 
working out. Of course not. I didn't ask you that question. But is, no, but, but am I, you asked if I'm scared of that mm. happening. Um, no, I'm not scared of it happening. Is there a possibility it could happen? Yes. Mm. But uh, I now, I think that the time has now passed. The fire has died down a little bit, mm. which is a good thing, I guess. Mm. So I can walk the streets more peacefully. Yeah. Do you think there's enough love in the world? No. And that's such a cliche answer, but I wouldn't even say the word love because... Or kindness, maybe. I would say, I would say appreciation. There isn't enough appreciation for other people yeah. and what other people contribute to the society that you live in. You don't have to love the... You don't have to love the shopkeeper. You don't have to love the guy who's building this road outside right now. I see there's construction workers. Mm. You don't have to love them. But I feel like... To look down on anyone. You, you know, like he said about his story, that is an embarrassing story. I believe like every individual had uh, a funny story, a sad story, um, a horror story, like embarrassing story. Like, and it's, it's interesting, you know, it's really interesting because uh, like I said it, I believe in every human being had a story in his and the funny, sad, it's not important, but we all have stories. And uh, it's... One day, why not? We just uh, we can do we can do a live, and you know we can do a live. You can call in it, and uh, we pick up and we share our f funny, interesting story with with the with the community, uh, with the subscriber in the channel, of course. And uh, yeah, you share your story. I share with your story, guys, and we have fun. If it's sad, we we've been sad. If it's funny, we laugh. If it's horror, it's a horror. I don't like horror in general. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, one day why not? We just uh, do a live and uh, we make video call and we talk, we talk and we share it on the YouTube in my channel. Of course, we share it in my channel and uh, yeah, it's gonna be really interesting for everybody to share his story. And I believe everybody like his story to be heard and he think that it's the most funniest story that ever happened to the human being and yeah I, will, I one day will give a platform for it to share it so for now we are really just almost 3k followers and by the time of 10k followers when i reach 10k followers i will be able to launch a to launch a, a live to do a live and a video call and share it on youtube and you everyone can share his stories wanting to not appreciate what other people bring to a society mm. is a very bad way of thinking and there's not enough appreciation in the world anymore mm. so everyone has always loved their i guess family their wife husband yeah. mother or father but no they people don't appreciate each other enough is appreciation a form of love it absolutely of course. is and all, all i can do is within my own little world and my own little community and everyone who does anything for me show them as much love and appreciation as i can mm. so i i can't change the world but you can change yourselves Mm. You know, say please, say thank you to, to waiters. It's very basic. It's very yeah. basic stuff. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I worked in, uh, I worked behind the counter and in the kitchen of a pret a manger. You know what that is because mm. you're British for three years or three and a half years. It's my first ever job. And I still remember the three or four people who'd ever said nice things at work. I remember some old lady came up. I was working late at night. My shift was supposed to be finished. But legally, when there are flight delays, you can't close down the food stores. So I was the only one there. And she came up and she'd written this really nice letter and said, give this to your manager tomorrow because uh, I think you've done a really great job. I remember her face. I remember that moment. And isn't that nuts? Because that is now 17 years ago. I, I st because kindness yeah. and appreciation is something that men certainly don't get enough of. And I still remember that lady. And I still remember the people who were incredibly rude to me. Yeah. You know? Well, what, what's that saying? They'll long forget what you said, but never forget how you made them feel. Yeah, exactly. Mm. I remember I was, uh, I was training for that exact same job, working behind the till. And my, I'm good with math. Quick, quick maths. I'm okay. I'm certainly okay. I was okay at the time. And this man came up to me, put some sandwiches, some coffee down on the table. And uh, he worked as, I guess, a banker or something. It was, I was somewhere in the financial district of London at the shop because the Luton Airport shop hadn't... hadn't uh, opened up yet and he was wearing a nice suit and he put a bunch of things down on the table. I can't remember exactly what the total was, but he, it came to just over 
10 pounds. And he gave me a 20, and then he got the little change out and gave it to me so I could give him a 10 pound note. So I'm looking in the till where things are. There are no 10 pound notes and there are no five pound notes. And I'm looking like this for about four to five seconds. And he went, well, I guess if you had a degree in maths like me, you could probably do that. And I'm like, you think I didn't get the math of what you just did? You think I didn't know to give you a 10 pound note back? But I was, I'm 16, like I was a kid. Mm. And this dude in a suit was getting mad to a little kid wearing a red cap. And there were no 10 or five pound notes. I just remember, I just remember thinking, what a horrible guy. Yeah. So I guess my revenge is that if he was a man working in the sea, he's probably been fired by now and I'm much richer than him. <laughs> so if you're watching this, sir, don't be rude to people who work at sandwich shops. <laughs> so, I, you still, but the, my point is there's not enough appreciation because you still remember those moments. Mm. And now I'm, a 30, I'm 36 this year. I was doing that when I was 15, 16 years old. So yeah, you still remember that. So mm. be kind to people. Mm. And is revenge sure. a form of success? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, success is a form of revenge. Yes. Success is the best form of revenge. Mm, of course. I don't believe in getting revenge on anybody. No. I've had people screw me Oh, yeah, those are meant. Break my heart, upset me. It's a very... So you, sort of, you, you, you do use success as a as form a revenge. of revenge. Yeah, but I don't do it for the revenge. It just naturally happens. Any concept of trying to... Who is it that... I think it was Mahatma Gandhi, he said, um, being, being angry at someone is like holding a burning stone in your hand. For so long, throwing at them. taking like too much energy. Do damage, but it will do you more damage first. I don't hold on to these. But it could be fuel, though, couldn't it? I mean, it, it, it can yeah. be, but I didn't ever need fuel. Mm. I didn't need fuel to, to go and make something of myself. It's just naturally happened as a form of revenge. Mm. I mean, people who have screwed me over for 200 pounds. You know, the only thing I'm... You know, it's true what he's saying here. It's, it's like really completely true. You cannot deny this. Uh, the way you, uh, it's, it's also true. The way you, uh, the best revenge is to be much more successful. But do you, th like he said, do you do you hold that energy so much that you? I want to, uh, I want to, I want to have my revenge on this guy that he was rude to me. It's probably gonna do do you more damage because it's a too much energy waste and it's taking too much energy of you and. You will never be able to be what you want it because it's all the attention is taken by the, the, the that through the moment. So I would say like just maybe you can hold it for one day, but that's much as much you can go and keep l l working on your goal. And one day, because you know what comes around, what goes around comes around. One day, you never know. You can meet up with the same guy that who was like who did this to you who who was rude to you you can meet up in one day and he will not recognize you but of course you're gonna recognize him and that's why how you're gonna have your revenge even though you still can treat him normally and he go hello hello i've been a long time ago and this is uh, nicely like shaking his hand nicely and saying like uh, you remember me and stuff like this talking and you show off for like how was successful you is, or you can just not pay attention to it and move on. Yeah, at the, the, the end of the day, it's up to you. Years ago, and I argued with them and fell out with them, are now watching me on the internet buying, you know, as Christmas bonuses, buying people who work for me Ferraris and Lamborghinis, thinking, shit, I should have stayed his friend, shouldn't have screwed him over for 200 You pounds. bought someone who works for you a Ferrari as a Christmas bonus. And a Lamborghini. And two, a Lamborghini. Two, two different people, yeah. They deserve it. They work incredibly hard. Yeah. They work incredibly hard. Uh, the videos are on Rumble right now. I just released them. So, right. So the people who screwed me over in the past are now watching things like this, thinking, oh, I wish I'd stayed friends with that guy. And I just oh. don't care. I don't really think about them. No. Uh, and it's the same with, you know, ex-girlfriends. I mean, I lost girlfriends when I was 19, 20, 21. After they broke up with me, they started dating some older, more successful dude. I don't know where these girls are. I don't look them up. But they're my age now, 35. Hopefully, they're happily married with kids. But if they're not, they're probably looking at me thinking, ooh, that was a boat I missed, maybe. I don't know, maybe they're not, maybe they don't think about me. But success is a form of revenge. I think it's the only form of revenge that any man should ever care about trying to reach because it's beneficial for you and it's the best form of revenge. Actually physically trying to what, hurt people, sue people, damage people, take any kind of revenge. It's very, it's got incel energy about it. You know what I mean? It's got, um, a, I guess I'll use the term, small dick energy. Oh, I need to get this person back. And it's, yeah, it's really stupid. So a success is the only type of revenge worth having. Mm. How did it make you feel when you gave people that work for you supercars? 
it made me feel amazing. Yeah. Uh, and it was kind of mind blowing for me that I was in the position to do these things for others. But as I said, I, I wouldn't say give them supercars. I rewarded yeah. their hard work for the year with a bonus. And as a bonus, I decided to buy them the cars. Yeah. But no, it made me feel very good. It made me feel very, I guess, proud of myself yeah. that I can do these kind of things. Because, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, life is about giving, but you can't give what you haven't got. Yes, exactly. And people say, like, money doesn't buy happiness. And the counter to <laughs> that, that... That's that what we spoke about it in everybody. the beginning. <laughs> said everyone with their money, yeah. <laughs> well, my answer to this, let's pretend you me, a real anti-capitalist kind of hippie type of person. This is the kind of person who says this to me. And I've got one question that always stumps them. So they'll say uh, they enjoy, for example, bumming around Asia, hitchhiking and mm. picking fruit off the trees and whatever crap they're into and meditating and taking weird, I don't know, smoking weird substances in India. But, you know, that kind of person, you know, the type of person I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Well, Tristan, money doesn't buy happiness. I say, well, what do you like to do? Well, I like to volunteer for charities and do this and travel. And I say, imagine how much more of it you could do if I gave you $10 million. Oh, money doesn't buy happiness. Why? Oh, I've got my mom and my kids, and my family, and that's my happiness. Imagine how much happier you could make them and how much more time you could spend with them if I gave you $10 million. There's nothing anyone can name that makes them happy that they couldn't do more of and to a greater extent exactly. it's, if I gave them Yeah, money. that's what we said in so the beginning. The, the money is a, a way of, uh, it's a tool, like, and well, the way of use it, it's up you to you. What that makes you happy? And they also is the cop-out of, well, I've got my dog and my daughter and my wife and my mom and you know that's what i've got mm. and they assume every millionaire and billionaire doesn't have these things mm. i've got all those things too not mm. a wife yet but i don't i have all those things too and i've got hundreds of billions of dollars so like it's just better mm. and uh, I, I don't like cop outs mm. yeah and, and what if your wife gets really ill you know a dear friend of mine um we we raised a lot of money for his wife who in mm -hmm. the end passed away but to get her over into europe to have emergency brain tumors removed was f***ing expensive. Exactly, exactly. My mother had a heart attack three weeks ago. Boom, Pri Harley Street Medical, mm. private surgeon, done, done, done. So yeah, um, you really, <coughs> it's better to have it and not want it than want it and not have it. Mm. So <laughs> yeah, money, money is- Well, money, yeah, I mean, you don't have free healthcare in, in UK anymore. You yeah. can't get in, so you have to pay twice. Exactly. You pay with your tax and you exactly. pay private. Well, I had a, uh, I, I was injured at a point in my life with my shoulder, and I had a, my, my shoulders now made an almost full recovery. Who did my surgery? I won't say his name, but same guy but who not did... not the NHS. No, same guy who did... That <laughs> guy did my shoulder, now it's perfect. Some NHS surgeon quickly butchering my arm. Like, God bless them, they're hardworking people, mm. but they're overworked, underpaid, too many people were coming to them, uh, their, their waiting lists are too long. You know, the, the hospitals are dirtier. People are dying from these hospital bugs and stuff. Mm. Like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not cursing NHS sur surgeons. They're wonderful people and they do a very important job. But going to a nice clean hospital in Dubai, you walk in, it's filled with trees and fountains. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a different experience. Mm. So healthcare, again, yeah, money buys, you know, they actually say money doesn't buy health. Well, it doesn't. It, it does. It, yeah, the, richest it people, does. the richest people over time have lived the longest. Exactly. So it, it mm. doesn't buy health in the way that anybody at any time can get terminal brain cancer. It doesn't matter how much money you have, but... But you got this guy, Brian Johnson, spending two years <laughs> people. And not a public service. Fair, and you know, people say things like, oh, you know, nurses should get millions. Nurses should be getting more. Or you can get that money and give it to nurses. But let me tell you something, so... So guys, we're gonna stop here for the moment. This one, we're gonna do it at the first part. Uh, there was interesting point as I told you it's gonna be funny it's gonna be uh, not history but it was about politics a little bit and I'm not really interested in politics I don't I don't like politics in general